<laughs> well, I'll stuff that one up. Anyway, good evening and welcome to episode number 22 of the Wonder of Stuff vodcast broadcast live on Google Hangouts on air. This, this, tonight is a Monday because we had all sorts, well, I had all sorts of strange dubiousness with networks, but the screwdrivers have been out and uh, it's all fixed now. Uh, we've got, uh, as always, um, oh, I've, I see, I'm all, I'm all of a fluff. A flutter and a, and a twizzle and a twiddle. Uh, anyway, let me just tell you what, what this is. This is the wonder stuff. It's the place where you'll find news, information, commentary on science, engineering, technology from the past week and beyond, and anything else that appears into our little brains. Um, my name is John Gardner, as always, and there's Ross and there's Richard, and we're all here. And um, uh, let's just get started. Uh, <laughs> Enjoyed, um, your, enjoyed your little dance when you forgot to switch your camera. Yeah, I, I, I was look, I was looking at the screen going, yeah, that's not right. I shouldn't be seeing. <laughs> what I'm hoping for is that the, the thumbnail is uh, the choice of you dancing because that's definitely the one that's getting picked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we were just talking before that uh, when when uh, when YouTube or uh, when Google Plus when it does a little thumbnail of the actual uh, the actual show. Well, Google, you can choose it in YouTube, but in Google Plus, it just takes the most animated thing. <laughs> so um, that's going to be a bit you get this week. See so who can, uh, who can get it? Who's it gonna do? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear. He was. He's a, he's a disco king, you know. As Richard. <laughs> what was that thing that he said? Do you remember that? Ross, oh, you said about he's dancing. Somebody text. Uh, Somebody said professional it, dancer, wasn't it? I was a professional dancer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, the first one's <coughs> off mine, so I'll, I'll get uh, I'll get started. Um, now I've got down here as a title uh, the world's largest plane, but that's actually inaccurate. It's it's the world's largest aircraft, and uh, the reason why that I have to be accurate there is because it's not actually an aeroplane. It's a cr it's a sort of hybrid, um, and it's a cross between an aeroplane and an Airship, and uh, it's. Can I guess? Can I guess what it is? Can you guess what it is? Oh, I can't do both of the jokes. Yeah, uh, one of those. Well, I know what used to be the biggest was one of those guppy type ones that they used to transport rocket parts in. So they had parts that couldn't be disassembled, basically. And I'm sure they were custom built by NASA. But did you ever see those with the? They were like the guppy yeah. fish that had the big. So it's not. Like but that was that. But that was just an airplane, though. Right. Okay. I, th I thought when you when you brought this subject up, I thought it was going to be one of those uh, what they call the Rakla planes, the Russian things that the Antonov, ground gra no, the ground effect ones that they don't actually fly; they just sort of go ten meters above the ground. Right. No. Okay, no, this fly. is something completely different again. Oh. This is um, uh, well, I've got a picture. I'll show you what it is. First, let me just share this out. And uh, as you can see, yeah, it is a big bulbous thing, um, and it's um, it's a it was developed developed by a company in Britain. Uh, we we are pretty good at developing airships, though. If anybody thinks back to the 70s and 80s, uh, we had a company called Airship Industries, and all, all of the uh, the airships around all of the sporting uh, grounds around that time were all designed by Airship Industries. But they all went there. They went um, bust uh, at the end of the uh, beginning of the nineties, I think it was. And um, another company bought them up, and then they they went into administration. But uh, this company here, called Hybrid uh, Air Vehicles, uh, bought all of the intellectual property and all of their research and development site and stuff. And uh, they're creating this called they call them Airlanders. And essentially. Um, what you'll see here is it's not a great picture actually. Now it was better; it's slightly better what, what I can see. But when you, it's very small here. But essentially, um, you've got uh, the big, um, the big fuselage which is full of uh, gas and, in, and helium, inert gas, and you've got some these about three quarters of the way down the fuselage. You'll see that these things uh, protrudences are the actual wings, and there's obviously a tail and there's another wing on the other side. Uh, now, what I was going to show you is uh, for people who just need to remind, remember about these things. Um, here's my little drawing. You remember about the Bernoulli uh, effect? Um, when you have uh, 
the whole point of how planes get are kept in the air is the balloon effect, which is an inverse rule where um, you've got fast airflow going over the top of the wing, uh, which creates um, less uh, pressure, and then if you've got slow going underneath, which creates a more pressure and pushes and gives lift. Um, and if I just flick over here, here's and this. The, the thing about this particular thing is over a standard aircraft or a standard airship is because, as you can see by my, it's a very Book Rogers actually, <laughs> I would have drawn it, but you'll see that the actual fuselage is, is wing-like, so it actually creates lift on the fuselage and also creates lift on the wings. And uh, plus the fa when you couple that with the fact that they've got, they've got, um, Engines side. both sides here and on the other side. These little red things that I've I've noted up here, and two at the back. It gives really good maneuverability, which which airships in the past haven't had because they've just had uh, the actual gas balloon with a little um, sort of uh, pagoda underneath it where people used to sit, and the little uh, the little fans were were attached to that. So you kind of got blown along, and the the directions were really really bad. So, but this one here, um, uh, as you can see, has got some extra. It's got some aircraft-like qualities, airline-like qualities, air, airplane qualities, as well as the the standard um, the standard thing. Now, the reason why I am showing you this is because um, uh, they won back in two thousand and nine. This company won a uh, five hundred million dollar contract with the U.S. military, and that's as you can see on that. Uh, that picture it had the United States Army on. Now, they'd, they'd already built a, uh, a couple of prototypes, um, and there is a there is a, a video on their website which I was going to show tonight, but uh, for reasons of technologically ineptitude, I can't actually show it to you. Um, but it, it what happened was they they'd actually produced these uh, these these crafts as a prototype. Got them flying and everything, and they were they were really impressed. Um, but the financial uh, world changed, and the the contract was cancelled. Um, but because uh, they'd already spent ninety five or ninety million dollars on them, uh, they were managed to they managed to buy back the prototypes for three hundred thousand dollars. So the the government the American government had already given them ninety five million and they bought the whole thing back for 300,000 so they've come out of it quite well uh, the, what, the, the reason why I'm talking about this now is because they're going this week actually in two days time they're going to do a crowdfunding event so if you you too can uh, can put money towards these these wonderful beasts and uh, and hopefully hopefully the, there's a whole industry in there so in, t in terms of like what they advantage they have over a big plane, how much can they lift? Like how much? Well, the they've got two they've got two products: the Airlander 50, the Airlander, Airlander 200. The, the 51 has two uh, big um, pockets of air, uh, pockets of air, pockets of helium, and that can lift about 50 tons. And the one with the three pockets of helium uh, is a 200 ton lift. Which is which is really good. Now, the what the Swedish uh, sw there's a Swedish um, renewable power uh, company who want to use these to lift air um, uh, air turbines to uh, remote parts of Sweden that they can't really get there get them there on uh, on with road transport. So stuff like that. I mean, obviously reconnaissance was one of the things that they were they were quite good at, but Lifting heavy things that uh, quietly is pretty good as well because they, 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 they don't really make a great deal of noise. That's well, the main thing. That's well, the, the main thing. Well eh? well, show up quite well on radar, though. That's nice. Yeah. Possibly. Also, I know that um, the Hindenburg timing was unfortunate. Obviously, the loss of life is unfortunate, but um, I think because that project of um, airships was kind of like first coming to public attention and it was so heavily scrutinized at the time, and then you obviously had one incident and a huge loss of life, 
it damaged the brand. It damaged the brand of the company. Obviously, the company went bust, didn't they? But also, it just damaged the reputation of that kind of aircraft generally. And you wonder if they'd been going maybe 50 years before something like that happened, or if they just chose an alternative gases from the beginning, that maybe we would have we would see a lot more of these craft before now. Do you think? Yeah, I mean it's true. I mean because they do they do work, and and um, obviously since the since the 70s and 80s, all airships have had uh, were have had helium in. Uh, obviously, helium's an inert gas. Um, but of course, the problem is that we're in we're in the we're in the midst of a of a, a real shortage of helium. Um, the world is is seeing uh, the the least amount of helium that we've got. Uh, all the reserves are are, are, are running out. And that's mostly because, the Premier League footballers that have been taken, it, doesn't it? According to the papers. Yeah, but well, mo most of it is because people put it in party balloons and then have squeaky Mickey Mouse voices. And <laughs> but I mean, of course, there is a serious thing. Of course, we 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 need helium for uh, MRI scans and scanners and all sorts of things like that. They use it for cooling and stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of medical. That's where most of the helium goes. Is in medical. Um, so, Ross, what's the reason that it's rare because it's abundant on the periodic table? That would lead you to believe that it's abundant because it's uh, low down in the numbering. So, what what's the reason that it's that it's rare? Well, um, I suppose very rare. It's very abundant in stars. Um, so it's just that on Earth, we're finding a hard time finding it. I mean, yeah, they're, they're supposed to have a helium on a helium, was it helium three on the moon or whatever, isn't it? That's one of the reasons to go back to the moon to basically extract that. Um, but I don't know. I don't know whether it's just that we've we've you know extracted the easily available helium already, um, or whether it is actually rare. Not sure. Yeah, it is. It is. It's the most. It's the most um, uh, abundant element in the in the observable universe. But on Earth, because it's just it's a byproduct of of reactions, um, and and a lot of those are. For you know, in 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 the in the actual in the actual Earth itself, in you, know, you have to mine for st stuff like this. It's it, we do seem to be um, we do seem to be running out. Now, the the only I mean, so that's a that's a big of it. That's a big issue for for something like this. So there's no um, reaction we can, I guess, other than a a star being formed or being destroyed, whichever it is. There's no reaction you can really do that's going to produce it then, or not in not in efficient amounts anyway. Not easy, uh, I don't think. No, I mean, I think you, you. I mean, you get it from from nuclear reactions. Um, but so basically, the reason it's not here and it's elsewhere is that if it was here, those reactions would be hostile to life, and then therefore we wouldn't be here. So when you get life, you don't get helium, I guess, generally speaking. Yeah, I, I think you also get that it's a it's a it's a byproduct of the extraction of natural gas. But the problem is that. Um, Capturing the helium that's created from the natural gas extraction process is more expensive than than getting the natural gas out. So it, it's a it's one it's an economic thing as well, I think. So they're going to start saying instead of buy gold shares now, buy helium shares now. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> the, of course, the thing is, I mean, there are there are the um, lighter than air gases out there, but a lot of them are either uh, poisonous, flammable, um, or both. And the only other, I think, the only other real option is neon, and that's even, <laughs> that's even worse to get hold of, mm -hmm. because it's 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 just expensive to to act. And we haven't got so to maybe move. even if even if the Hindenburg hadn't happened, maybe we wouldn't have seen this technology really take off because of this lack. Take of off! Oh, I like what you did there. Because of this, <laughs> because of the just the constraints on the, well, like you say, gases that are going to. Could generate lift by themselves. It's true. It's true. But I, I, they are. Um, I, I just. I don't know. I'm. 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 I'm really intrigued by the. I've always been intrigued by airships and and uh, things like that. But, you know what they could do? What they could do is just sort of like get normal air and make it warmer, because that that will get lift. Like like a hot air balloon. Like like a like a hot air balloon. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It, I, I wonder why nobody's ever thought of that, Ross. Why has no one ever thought? Of that? But, it, but, but seriously, is it just that? Seriously, it's just that they don't scale, isn't it? That you, the amount of um, because lot yeah. uh, does generate lift, but it's not anywhere near the amount of lift as helium. So you need you need a huge canopy for a little basket, basically. That's the reason. For it. 
And that, and I, I guess that, that is the same thing about that. I mean, the, the difference between this than, than other airships is, uh, um, I noticed on the video, is that it can actually start from actually ground level, because all of the other ones are all, like, they're tethered, and they're already floating, and you have to get, like, ladders up to them. But this is actually on the ground, and it actually... It, yeah, it doesn't actually need itself to be creating lift. It can it can take off like an aeroplane. Yeah, that's it? exactly it. it. Can take off. Yeah. It can actually. It's a very. Sl it, it can on the on the video, and you'll see this. I'll put the I'll put this on the show notes. But on the video, it does actually run along the ground and take off. It's very slow, but it can get up to 100 mile an hour, um, which is it's quite it's quite you know reasonable. Um, but it, it because it's so big, it just looks really slow and ponderous. So can it get faster than that in the air, or is that its top speed? Where where well, 100, 100 mile an hour? That's about I think that's about the top speed. Yeah. yeah so so it's, it's not gonna it's not gonna uh, right to be a bit of a bit of a pain then. Yeah. Anyway, so that I, I thought I'd start with that one because it's interesting, um, and it's it's it's. It's topical because they're trying to do crowdsourcing for the whole thing to, to refund it uh, this week. Um, so I'll put that uh, those links on the uh, on the show notes. How much are they trying to get from the crowdsourcing? Uh, another 90, another ninety five million. It's it's gonna be it's gonna have to be something like that, or else it's not gonna be economic, really. I mean, they've got they've got to. Why would I want? Why would I want to source that? Because you are an entrepreneur who has. You oh know, right, what well, you get to make back out of it, like do you? Uh, so take you on a trip across to America, is I don't know actually. I, had, I did have a look at it, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't actually find what I would get out of it. It's crowdsourcing <laughs> without uh, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding rather, um, without any getting anything back. It's That's benefit. I couldn't find anyone anyway. I mean, part of the fact that I would like quite like a, I quite like to have a, a riding one, but um, but I don't think that was on the list. And it's not, and it, they're not using a website or anything. You have to turn up to, um, I think it's in Bedfordshire. You have to turn up to the to the, to their hangar, and, uh, and pledge the money there. So, anyway, that's uh, that's enough of that one. Uh, I'm going to go on to Ross now, and Ross has something which could be really exciting. Ross, really exciting. It could and be. My, my... Might not be. Yeah, well, the title is NASA's warp drive, and it, and and is it true oh, that NASA that means it's going to be disappointing because it's not going to be real? <laughs> should have, Richard. You, should have, you Richard. never know. <laughs> Your negative attitude. I but believe so, well, but, you yeah, told me that this NASA is... might have, have have invented a warp drive accidentally. Yeah, NASA may have accidentally created a warp drive. Um, so basically, this is something that it was. Um, actually something that was on a, a NASA forum, actually. Um, and basically, a warp drive, obviously, you'll have, you'll have heard of warp drives if you've ever watched Star Trek. Um, you know, travel vast distances, faster than speed, light, and all this. Brilliant. Um, and the, the idea of a warp drive is that it, it works by, rather than moving a craft faster than speed, light, the idea is that you warp space around the craft. So the idea is you would contract it in front, expand it behind, and you would actually the craft would effectively remain stationary, but you'd be moving space. Um, now, I've got a handy diagram to show what that's, that, that means. It's probably, let's have a look. So, if you can see that, so basically this is a bit nice visualization. Um, no, oh, I can see it now. Yeah, so the blue in front is, is contracting in space time, the red behind is, is expansion. Um, now, Theoretical physicist looked into this. Um, there's a physicist called Miguel Alcubier who came up with the with the concept of this sort of bubble of space time. He sounds pretty uh, pretty theoretical. Yeah, <laughs> um, but unfortunately, all of his maths showed that energy that was required for this was basically just it was just impractical. Um, but then another NASA um, scientist called Harold White um, basically. Uh, worked out that if you make a donut shape, you could significantly reduce the energy needs. So, anyway, that, that, that's all purely theoretical at the moment. Um, and very controversial, as you can imagine. Uh, but anyway, meanwhile, in another lab, um, NASA have been working on something called an 
M drive. Now, this is basically a, a, a method of propulsion that uses um, a magnetron, which is basically a, a big vacuum that generates microwaves um, and using the magnetic field. Um, and the idea is that it actually uses microwaves for thrust. Now, this in itself is controversial because it seems to disagree with fundamental laws of physics of action and reaction because there's no moving parts, there's no like reactive mass. If you imagine a, a normal rocket engine, you fire something out that way and you go this way. So, it, you know, conservation of momentum, that sort of thing. Um, so there's lots of con controversy about that and whether it's real or not. They have made them. They have... Um, I have, a, I have another picture of one of those as well, which I shall show you now. Um, oh, we've got lots of diagrams tonight. So basically, this is a, a prototype of, of one of these drives. Um, and they, they have they have experimented them. They have got some results. Um, they, they say that it, but basically, the, the controversy is that they, they need to do it in a perfect vacuum to make sure it's not sort of like, you know, some other effect. Um, so anyway, so what does it have to do with warp drive? Um, basically, what they were doing was they were using a tool um, to measure variances in sort of like, they, they fired lasers through basically to measure the speed of light. And what they found was that some of the laser beams, as they traveled through these, these M drives, um, they appeared to travel faster than the speed of light. And when they mapped it, they basically created a, a, like an interference pattern. And when they measured it, it looked exactly like the warp drive bubble that was predicted from the, um, Miguel Alcubierre's predictions of a warp drive. And this was completely by accident. They weren't expecting to see this. Um, they just basically found something that happens to work exactly the same as how someone else predicted it would work. So this is why I was saying it's an accident. Now, obviously, this is very, very early in this. There's a lot of controversy as to whether it's actually real or not. Um, is it, is, it, is it re reproducible? Have they managed to reproduce it subsequently? They've reproduced the, the, they've reproduced the measurements, but um, there's, there's a lot of discussion as to whether what's actually happening is that the drive is, is affecting the way the measurements work as opposed to making what they're measuring happen, if you know what I mean. So it, it's one of these things where the, the effect of, of it happening and the effect of the measuring it happening are the same thing, but obviously one's more likely that it's actually the measuring device which is getting affected in some way. Um, they're just not sure how. Um, now, I did, I did try going on the NASA forum and actually reading the 95 pages of comments from NASA's theoretical physicists. <laughs> But I, I, I didn't make it through before this week's episode. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure what the actual outcome is, but it'd be interesting to find out because there's, there's an sure ongoing someone conversation. Will have written a, someone will have written a synopsis of that, I would have thought. Or the will. Well, there, there, there's a, there's a, um, the only article I found was, on, was actually on something called Mysterious Universe. This is the one that was, that was reporting it. Um, so... It's 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 up in the air at the moment, and we'll see what happens. But if they do create if they do create a warp drive, it basically means that that obviously there's the fundamental laws of the universe that you can't you know physically travel faster than the speed of light. But warping space is what you know. Obviously, science fiction is used. It's used black holes and stuff like that, warp um, wormholes, um, <clears throat> and warping space seems to be a. a I was going to say practical, a maybe not practical, but a, a, a potential way of traveling to nearby stars, um, because obviously just traveling the speed of light is is takes up an exponential amount of energy, and you would take time. You know, you still take time to get there, and you've got the effects of you know general relativity and aging and this sort of thing. But if you could warp space around you and bring effectively bring the far objects close to you. Um, that, 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 that would work. It's probably still going to take a tremendous amount of energy, um, but theoretically it's perfectly possible. So, Ross, um, when do we actually have... Um, when do we actually get the Millennium Falcon? Um, that will be... Um, it, it'll be in a galaxy far, far away. Far away. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's Presum- uh, I, presumably the I've always wondered this about Star Wars. You might know by you might know if you know some of the the myth around it, but um, presumably they did start here though because they're humans, aren't they? No, no. Like some of them are. Well, some of them are humans, aren't they? No, no they're not humans. Are they not? No, I don't think so. Luke Skywalker. No, Skywalker. They are. Luke Skywalker's a human. Yeah. Han Solo's. Han Solo was human. They just look human. All oh, right. I don't, I don't think humans ever. I don't think humans ever mentioned in Star Wars. Right. We'll have to look this up. It's just yeah, okay. That's just the species that you relate to, basically. Mm-hmm. Oh no. We'll find out when we get the new films. I think you find John. here. It states here in the Wikipedia. Yeah. Oh. That Han Solo was a human smuggler from the manufacturing planet Corellia. So originally, originally must have come from Earth then. Well, no, humans come from Earth. I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. that. I mean, unless of course Earth just doesn't exist in this fictional universe, I suppose. Doesn't Star Trek? Is, oh, it, is, that, is that humans in the Lord of the Rings thing franchise? Where is it, isn't that? Well, that is it is Earth, Middle Earth. Yeah, but it's, it's not Earth, though, is it? It's a different Earth. It's a completely different planet. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> so I anyway, just suggest just... that the, the, we're humans and they used a warp drive to get to a galaxy far, far away. That's what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. Or possibly, um, but anyway, I'll, 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 I will keep an eye on this and see if I can find, like you say, someone at some point must make a very simple explanation of why this is a load of rubbish or not. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, that let's have a look and see what I'll see how many pages the message board's got up to now. Because I imagine it's got up quite far. So on 103 oh, pages now. I reckon how you'll many? have um, Micho Kawa, whatever he's called. You'll have him coming out saying. Yes, this really will happen, and then you'll have Stephen Hawking coming out going, "No, this won't happen." <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, there's people are talking about copper frustrum reverse thrusts, thrusts at 1,937 megahertz with 2.1 watts average. Leave Chris, leave Chris out of this. <laughs> Q thruster RF FM modulation versus thrust mag and slope one. So yeah, I don't, I don't know what that's one, but there's lots of pretty pictures. Um, when, a physicist, when a physicist well, doesn't know what he's talking about, what, what's talking about on there, it must be complicated. Well, look, if you'd sent if you'd sent this, if you'd sent the people fifty years ago that would have um, magnet-driven hovering trains that just have just broke, broken the speed record, people would probably say it ridiculous. Yeah, so. maglev. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. How fast did that that train go in Japan? It was was it six hundred and something miles an hour? Yeah, no, it can't. Was no, it, it was fast? kilometers an hour. Six hundred. I was going to say. That'll be getting up the speed of sound. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, fast you know, it's not beyond you the realm. You certainly will not get that speed on the East Coast Main Line. No, no. Actually, that's something that we will have to keep an eye out of, which is that uh, thrust thrust car that's going to go 1,000 miles now. It's 374. Oh, this is, this is the follow-up to from the thrust SSV, is it? It's the, it's the next yeah. one. Next one, yeah. 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 I'm going to try and do that this year. Right, okay, well, moving on from that, uh, Ross, lovely, lovely, and uh, on to Richard. Richard's got, well, he's got two, really. He's got a main story, and he's got a, something that he'd been to uh, last week. So um, first one's about gut microbes. Yeah. So um, this, actually, the study itself is perhaps more interesting than the finding. There's a tribe in Papua New Guinea, um, I don't know if this comes as a surprise to you, but it was a little bit surprising to me. But they've been completely isolated from human contact for, well, for as long as history records, basically, 11,000 years. Um, and they had, so they knew of us, they knew of outside humans. They had words for planes and things like that, uh, planes and helicopters, but there'd, there'd been no direct contact whatsoever, which means that they've had no Western medicine, no antibiotics, no um, 
um, sewage systems, no, nothing like that. So what they were interested to look at was to see how much a Western lifestyle, a modern lifestyle, um, differs from from these native tribes people in terms of gut microbes. Um, so gut microbes is obviously something that helps in the breakdown of food, but also immuno health is, has very much a role. And we're finding out as time goes on that it's got these microbes have got more and more and more the more and more implicated in human health than we previously thought. Um, so what they found was they studied they studied um, the fecal matter of these these tribes people uh, and compared it with the average American, um, and they found that they had thirty to forty percent more species than the average American of gut microbes. So not only did they have more volume of actual individual um, microbes, but also the biodiversity of those microbes was a lot more. Um, and they believe that some of the microbes that they have um, um, could is actually responsible for um, keeping kidney stones at bay. So this is a species that is now extinct in the Western population, um, but exists in these tribes and previous tribes that they've studied. Um, have this species of, of microbe and we don't and it prevents kidney stones or appears to protect against kidney stones um, but there are, there's also species that are um, linked to immune system diseases, allergies, Crohn's disease, autoimmune disorders, multiple cirrhosis um, and more speculatively but also now being thought to be linked is um, diabetes, obesity and asthma could also be implicated by, by the health of your gut and these microbes. So, so are, are there instances of those sort of um, conditions measurably lower in these? I assume they are. That's how they know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if they are. Um, I think, I know in the case of stomach ulcers, because I've read about this before, I actually find it really interesting. As someone who doesn't have great gut, gut health myself, I do find it really interesting. And, you know, there's the saying that the next um, sort of... Um, fad treatment, which actually has some evidence behind it, um, is like fecal transplants, which sounds like a, a, an awful sounding idea, but... Can you become a donor for that, can you? <laughs> yeah. But basically the idea gut. is that if you've got an imbalanced gut, um, there's all sorts of immuno diseases and stomach related diseases that, that balancing out your gut microbes could resolve, so that it's a new a new type so of treatment that's being explored. Like the opposite of one of those NMA things or whatever. Just Yeah. Well, yeah. this is the thing. So this is the this the reason that it is speculated to to be the reason that we've got less than they do is antibiotics. Um especially if you take antibiotics when you're young and you, you the um just as you're sort of establishing yourself, that's part of the reason believe that your immune health is, is worse when you're a youngster is that these microbes are yet to get to the the numbers that they need in a, in a healthy adult, but also the balance, so the balance between the good and the bad. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a hypothesis rather than a yeah. rather than something that's highly evidenced, but it, like I say, it's a new area. Um, but yeah, if you take antibiotics when you're young, it's thought to have an even larger impact because those those species could be lost permanently. And of course, I imagine you're just... Those. I imagine just diet as well will have a big effect on it. Diet, um, well, more it's more um, sort of that communal. So because we've got better hygiene um, and we've got better sewage taking, you know, there's fecal matter getting passed between people in those. I know it's not a very nice topic, but you know that is how it how it works is that the fecal matter contaminants get onto people's hands and and because you haven't got antibiotics and you haven't got hand wash and you haven't got well even detergents and soap and things like that um, it's not saying that you know it's still the, the, the researchers are still saying they're not trying to promote living a lifestyle like these people clearly not clearly the net benefit is what we have but one of the sort of um, unexpected consequences of this high levels of hygiene has been that we've, we've lost these microbes which, which seem to be um, really important but it's things like clean drinking water as well um, yeah. That's one of the major ways that you would, you know, if you're sharing contaminated drinking water, you get these gut microbes into your system. Um, but also get dysentery. Yeah, exactly. 
So, but obviously, what you want to do is what you want to do is if you find out these communities do have less of these disorders, and you you do a follow up study and you establish that, then potentially either a fecal transplant, you know, which is obviously completely sterile, and so then you're safe from any of the bad stuff. You just get the the goods. Well, I'm saying completely sterile. I guess it won't be sterile of the of the. But yeah, you, you, you treat it in some way so that you don't get dysentery, but you get the microbes, and that would be the best of both worlds there. Well, it, it's interesting because uh, it's one of these old, I don't know, it, you know, it's an old wives' tale or an old mother's tale. I mean, my mother always used to say that, uh, you know, you'd have to go out and play in the dirt because that would help build up your immune system. Um, and she's always been against this thing in in the 21st century where... Everybody has to be clean all the time and keep cleaning them and cleaning them. Well, Ross is a bit like that because Ross and I remember having this debate before about things. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's what you said before, though. It's, it's a balancing act, isn't it? That you don't, obviously, you don't want to promote, um, you know, if you have a baby, you don't want it getting in the dirt in case it gets botulism or something like that, which is obviously the consequences of getting that is a lot more, you know, it's risk, isn't it? That you, you know, if you get that, the baby could be a goner. Whereas if you keep them from all of that and let their immune systems build up and then expose them gradually over time, maybe that's a better. But yeah, it, obviously in this case, you're right. It, the the one of the unintended consequences has been too much clean drinking water, too much hygiene has saved it from a great deal of things. But at the same time, the cost has been we've lost these good fauna, and they may be responsible for keeping us healthy. Yeah. It, it, but it's what you said, though. It, it is. It's a balance in this case, isn't it? It's it's not going overboard with everything. It's it's being um, pragmatic about what you how you, how you keep clean. Yeah. It's not you know. Well, you just approach it in the same way as you approach nutrition. You find out that this community eats seafood or olive oil or whatever it is, um, and you adapt it to the levels that suit you and suit you're healthy and you don't have to then move to Italy and live every everything like an Italian. You just take that part and bring that in. And so if if we can identify the particular microbes and just take them without having to um, live in the dirt, as it were, then, then that's the way to do it, isn't it? Indeed. Indeed it is. Um, the phrase of the night so far is fecal transplant. <laughs> I was going to do it as a topic a while ago because it, it actually is fascinating but um, A, we've had a poo one and B, I didn't really fancy doing a poo one anyway so <laughs> Right, okay <laughs> well thank you for that Richard um, But uh, so we don't end on a poo story um, you, you went uh, to a seminar last week at uh, Newcastle University and uh, you're going to tell us a bit about that as well yeah, um, it was the Café Scientifique in Newcastle, and um, they have like, um, well, the way it was explained was, was sort of like more relaxed talks, so it doesn't feel like a lecture, but ultimately it is professors giving talks on their subject, but it's in a cafe, so that you, you f it's meant to promote more sort of engagement and things like that, so it's more, it's more informal. Um, but they had Professor Carl, well, I'm not going to get his name right, Hennigan from the University of Oxford up um, and he's the director for the Centre of Evidence-Based Medicine in Oxford so an interesting person to meet and hear talk um, but he was talking about dangerous drugs and deadly devices and the theme was uh, well the way I interpreted the theme through the talk was that um, it's surprising how little you have to do to get a drug to market and how even less you have to do to get a medical device to market. So he was talking some of the case studies of drugs that have been on the market for a couple of years and killed more people than they cured and devices that have basically had the equivalent of a, a British stamp of approval for the device to be used with no no scientific evidence that it, that it, that it cures people or limits their illnesses, and yet they've made it into the market. So it was a bit... It's, it came across as a little bit of a pessimistic talk, but I think he was just being realistic and just trying to highlight the, you know, the risks. We we always assume that, that medicines are there and are going to help us, but there's sometimes more to it. And a lot of the time, evident, you know, when he when he introduced himself as the um, 
director of um, evidence-based medicine, I was thinking to myself... As what other type of medicine is there? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but his talk show that there's plenty, you know. He did a, he did a drug... Um, I was explaining this to Ross, I think, on, on Friday, so we've heard this before, but um, he was talking about a drug that uh, tracked a condition with the heart where the heart develops a piece of scar tissue and then the, elect the electrical signal then goes unevenly when the heart beats arrhythmia, and um, that leads to like a, a rapid heartbeat, so you can have like 200 beats a minute, and those people have a shorter life expectancy, as you might expect, than, than people who don't have this. And they, they, this drug that was already in circulation for something else, they found when they gave it to people that it cured the machine. So the machine, instead of going da dun da da dun started going da dun da dun da dun So people had normal heartbeat, and they're like, oh, well, this works. This cures the machine, so therefore it works. So they gave it to the American uh, public, um, and I think it might be in the 60s, and um, basically, long story short, it killed it killed 50,000 people when they when they went to do an evidence-based trial of it they trialed it versus placebo and it killed 50,000 people more in a two-year period than placebo so it was killing people it was actually giving people heart attacks and not curing them from risk of heart attack um, so it killed was this ever made public because I don't I don't recall even in the yeah, well this was his point that it it killed as many Americans nearly as many Americans as the Vietnam War and yet it's not really something that's that's well known or well documented. But he gave his talk was basically two hours of giving case studies like that. It was really interesting. But um, so doing it's examples very, like it's that, where very where, similar to what um, Ben Goldacre would do, then. Yeah, he was he he actually referenced Ben Goldacre, and he was he was a little bit like that. Um, but yeah, more people like him, please, is is my opinion. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for, yeah, just, for those just, of you for for the for the viewers who haven't. Read any Ben Goldegger? He's got a series of books um, along the the titles of Bad Science and um, and also his website's pretty good as well. Uh, and his Twitter feed, he's, al he's always um, he's always showing evidence of of bad science all over the place. So it's nice to know that there are. It's not just him uh, on a lone furrow that he's yeah. treading. So, so this bloke. He was the professor of evidence-based science at Oxford, or for like sort of the scientific community. Was it just an Oxford position? He's the director of Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine at University right. of Oxford. So I don't know whether or not that means that there's other centres for evidence-based medicine at other universities, or this is the UK's main one. I'm not sure, but um, I think he's a leading, a leading person on this on these matters, and he's he talked about how he was a um, external consultant for the Tamiflu debacle, you know, where we bought mm. basically loads of Tamiflu that didn't work. Um, yeah. But actually what I asked him, we had an opportunity to ask him questions at the end, and I was asking him what I've heard of a concept before called the sunken losses fallacy. So it's the it's a psychological thing where he didn't actually use that term, but it, it's, he seemed to be very much saying with the Tamiflu and others, what happens is the investment, so they put 15 million or whatever, 15 million or 15 trillion investment in and then um, it comes to renew it I think it was 15 billion maybe and then they came to renew it and it was going to be 30 billion but because they'd spent the 15 they kind of oh we'll have to spend the 30 um, mm. and it seemed to me just to be a, a psychological thing rather than looking at the evidence does this work this is another 30 million on top of the 15 we've already spent it seemed to be a case of well we've sunken this cost in now we can't see not face, yeah to yeah, see if we've we'll got to carry on. Yeah. And it's this kind of thing that you, you see when, you know, somebody's doing a university course that they really hate or reading a book that they don't even like. Mm. That That's the name of the, of, the, of the sort of bias where you stick with it, even though you're not enjoying it, even though it's not good, or even though the evidence is showing that it doesn't work. Your sort of inbuilt cognitive bias is saying, yeah. well, you've committed now, just carry on with that. Yeah, you're, you're already invested, so... But the way to the way to get out of it, I mean, he he answered the question by saying more transparency. But I guess more broadly, more evidence-based science, more public understanding of that, and then these mistakes won't happen because the public would be jumping on it straight away, saying, "No, this doesn't this doesn't seem to work. Why are we investing in this?" Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know about you guys, but I don't feel as though we're moving in that direction with the whole Professor Nutt thing, and then. 
you know, you've only got the Lib Dems who are saying that they would, um, you know, legalise cannabis, reduce um, barriers to access for medicinal drugs and, you know... Well, that's the, that's the trouble. You get, you get people who bring up the evidence and because it may be, um, evidence may be unpalatable, people get up a hide about the fact that what they're saying is sounds terrible. It's like you have to be sort of more impassionate about it because if these are the facts, yeah, whether you like it or not. But yeah, that's. I guess, well, I guess it's a, it is a tricky one because I guess MPs argue that or legislators argue that it's not really about the evidence; it's about public of harms and and what's right for the public, and it's a very complicated thing. But where there's yeah. a clear hypocrisy, that's that's what annoys me is when you know, tobacco and alcohol are legal and, you know, we don't seem to, you know, if you want to run the argument the other way rather than, it's not, it's not necessarily people like you and I, or maybe the three of us, I guess, it's not the media that we're for decriminalization of this specifically, it's that we're saying, look, if, you, if you're not going to decriminalize that, you need to criminalize that then because it's a hypocrisy. Yeah. It's not necessarily saying decriminalize more stuff. You might end up with a system where more stuff's criminalized, but it's just, you want it based on the evidence. You know, we've talked about this on a previous show a little bit, haven't we? But yeah, um, but yeah, just more in in general. He was talking about hip replacements and cervical scans um, and testicular scanning and stuff like that, which actually has a very very poor rate of diagnosis. Yet lots of money gets spent on it. There's lots of public pressure for it to happen, and actually the evidence shows it's the evidence arguably shows that it's not a particularly useful way of approaching approaching those diseases because it causes mental anxiety and stress to people and, and if the tests don't really work, you gave the example of um, breast cancer which obviously is a, is a massive one that people campaign for and yet he was saying that only one in three best breast cancers that you can detect for um, can be treated because the rest either the disease is self-limiting um, or the patient obviously dies before the treatment, before di diagnosis is done. So actually, it's only one in three diagnoses is useful. So it's surprising that to find that out, isn't it? That you think, you you know, in your mind you sort of think, oh, 99% of that probably is is good, but actually only one third results in in a benefit for the woman. So yeah, or man, I guess men get breast cancer as well, don't they? Hmm, intriguing. But yeah, um, have these events on. I can thoroughly recommend them. Um, it's quite a small room, and you know, if all of our thousands of viewers go, they probably won't all get in. But um, <laughs> is, is it a regular thing? Is it? They have basically. It's not just science. Um, they have. It's a cafe culture, so they have other um, disciplines going along. Um, they'll have guests, speakers from all sorts of disciplines speaking, and I think it's kind of like a swap shop. They. We have professors up here, and we send professors down there, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And is it on so regularly? Is it on once a month? I mean, Andrea mentioned it to me about two months ago, and this was the first one that uh, piqued my interest significantly enough to go. But just because of my narrow area of influence, I'm sure if you're a bit more, uh, if you've got a broader range of interests than I have, you might find more to go and see. With. No, that's clearly not true, Richard. Well, I mean, there's like, for instance, there's, there's loads of stuff uh, about the arts and and that sort of thing. If you if that takes your fancy, you can go and see that. Oh. Which has no interest whatsoever. And that's <laughs> in uh, Newcastle University. University. Newcastle University, uh, once a month, is it? Um, well, I, 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 I think it's just when they can get speakers. But, when they can um, get the speaker in. This is like the cafe of culture. It's not. It's it's. It's part of the university, but it, I think the university funded or something like yeah. that. Andrea, actually, that's probably gonna. Being annoyed that I didn't get this bit right, but anyway, um, no, this is um, the location is DC Cafe Dance City Temple Street, so it's down from the Centre for Life. Oh, D Dance, Dance City. City. Yeah. All right. Uh, yes. Okay. I know, you know where that, that is. Do you? Yeah. Um, well, uh, probably what would be best to do then, if if we if these are coming on and they're particularly of our area of interest, we'll get from Andrea uh, some more information and we'll we'll publicize it on the next yeah, one's on. I, do. I was going to say that the next one's on 18th of May, and it's called Grim or Great Up North. Oh, yeah. 2015 general election, how will the result affect you? Yeah, but that's, so that's not a science one, it's just a, 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 the politics one, is it? Yeah, the, the next cafe scientific is um, 
a midriff crisis averting comfortable lifestyle crises. On the first of these things are always more interesting than the title. You know, they're, more, they're always more interesting. Than the you, it's you shouldn't really judge it off the title because they can be really quite fascinating when you get into them. Um, can right? women do science? Yeah, that's a good. One. Can women do science? Well, yes. I think you even need to go and yes. see. Yes, that's, that's a short one. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can go and have a beer. Actually, we should do a thing on we should do a thing on bias at some point because I think it's a fascinating area. But just on that particular subject, I saw a thing where it was saying they were asking women and men, who would you prefer to have as an engineer? Who would you prefer to have as a scientist? And it was interesting that, um, by the way, this isn't an argument. Um, <laughs> this isn't an argument that we shouldn't be doing more for women. We definitely should. But it was also interesting to see that women had a lot of bias towards men by the same token. Um, you know, women were preferentially choosing women, um, which they're probably right a lot of the time, to be fair. But um, yeah, that, but bias works in, in counterintuitive ways as well. So, um, but yeah, it was great. So I'd recommend it. Excellent. Well, that does bring us nicely to the end of the program this week. Um, hopefully. We'll go back to the our normal time of a Sunday evening. Although saying that, it's a bank holiday Monday. It's a bank holiday next week, so we don't know. We know what we're doing next week. Should we just say Monday then? Monday, um, we can do that. Probably yeah. should. Okay, so next week it's going to be a Monday, and so it's Monday this week. Monday this week, uh, next week. Then we're back to the Sunday night, uh, same time, eight o'clock. Um, uh, BST, that's 1900 hours GMT, and uh, um, if you, I, I noticed there is a one viewer, there's one live viewer here tonight, I don't know whether that's Rob, he hasn't, if it is Rob, he hasn't commented, so if you are the live viewer who is streaming, <laughs> um, please tell us about yourself, oh no, it is Rob, it will be Rob, yes, he's there, <laughs> yes, um, uh, but if, if, if you know of anybody else who would in, be interested in this, tell them to come in. Tell them to come in. We'll join our little cosy little chat room here. And uh, if not, you can obviously watch the archive on uh, on YouTube. Um, as always, we've had our Twitter handles on tonight. Uh, our email is wonderstuff at gmail.com. Our URL is wonderstuff.blogspot.com. Come, come, be merry. Tell us about what you think of us and any topics that you want to discuss. Okay, that's it for this evening. Thank you for watching and uh, goodbye. Goodbye.